Good day. My name is Christopher Nesbitt. My wife, Selene Logan Nesbitt, and I manage a small NGO called Maya Mountain Research Farm located in San Pedro, Colombia, Toledo District. We're focused on climate change, uh, mitigation and adaption, income generation through the intersection of agriculture and ecology, uh, and food security. The NGO was founded in 2004, uh, but the farm itself was founded in 1988 when I bought a uh, degraded citrus and cattle farm. So let's define some degraded lands that we're likely to see in Belize. Uh, all over Belize we have former cattle pastures that are degraded where the soil is compacted. Uh, we have citrus groves that have come to the end of their productive lifespan. Uh, banana plantations that have come to the end of their productive lifespan are, are being abandoned. Uh, overwork milk or slash and burn uh, where proper fallow rotational cycles aren't being observed and fertility is dropped. Uh, any export based monoculture uh, including sugar and banana and pineapple, etc. Uh, fire de damaged landscapes. And for working with climate change mitigation and adaption and sort of regenerating landscapes, uh, degraded landscapes are, are some of the low hanging fruit. Worldwide, there's 950 million to 1.1 billion acres of degraded agricultural landscapes. So in the 1980s uh, and in, in the last uh, 40 years, um, Belize went from having 74.4% forest cover uh, in 1980. In 2010, we had 62.8% forest cover. And seven years later, we had dropped to 57.6% forest cover. Um, so not only is the forest disappearing, but the rate of destruction is increasing. Uh, the cause is a combination of shifting cultivation, um, uh, cattle ranching, and monocultures and uh, for export. Uh, one of the problems that, that we see uh, working in agroforestry is that uh, a damaging event that happens many years has escaped agricultural fires. This is an agricultural fire that occurred across the river from where I live, uh, and it burned many acres and escaped. Um, and this happens every year. I worked at Toledo Cacao Growers Association from, from 1997 to 2004, uh, and ran the extension program, and these were some farmers that we were working that were outside of uh, the area that we had been working in. They were uh, farmers up in Trio, Trio Junction, Bella Vista. And so they had all, uh, they're from El Salvador and um, Honduras, and all of them, the three of them there, the, the man with the notebook is my neighbor, Ignacio Ash. Uh, the three men there had planted out four or five acres of cacao apiece. And a fire just came and erased it after about four years' worth of work. It was a truly uh, big tragedy. Um, another thing that we're seeing, the creation of degraded landscapes, is where people are clearing into land that's simply not suitable for agriculture. This is a uh, hillside that my wife and I used to pass when we were teaching at Tumulkeen School of Learning. Um, and we would pass it, and it, uh, some Guatemalan uh, refugees who were, were in Toledo District squatted that land that's basically crown land behind private land um, where they cleared it into the hillside and uh, revealed that there was a, a lot of limestone, uh, not a lot of soil, and they planted corn, and the corn crop, of course, didn't do very well. And, uh, but the, in addition to the small yield that they got for the amount of energy they expended, uh, they erased all the ecosystem services that that primary habitat provided, which was Soil and soil moisture retention, habitat creation, and of course the big one everybody's talking about, carbon sequestration. Uh, we'll see more of that um, as people are looking for land uh, to farm. Um, we're beginning to see some of the problems associated with climate change. Uh, in 2017, the foothills of the Maya Mountains were hit with a series of uh, one big kind of flooding event then um, that was un un not expected. And uh, this is a vega up in, in um, San Benito Poite, a photo taken by my friend Valentino Shell, uh, showing what happened to the corn crop there. Of course, we have a vega, and we grow corn and other stuff, and we lost a lot of our corn. Um, but the pumpkin was actually tenacious and held on, and we ended up doing okay with it. Uh, but we didn't do well with corn. Um, other problems, we're seeing drought. This is a, a photo taken by my friend Louis Sewell at, at Citrus, uh, Citrus Growers Association. Uh, showing a corn crop that, that failed up in Cayo District. Uh, one that we saw was in uh, on the Hummingbird Highway, I think near Middlesex. Um, and this is a, a, a cornfield that's been cropped repeatedly. I imagine they're using a fair amount of fertilizer. It's very intensive, 
very closely planted. I'm sure it's very, very productive in years where it produces. But this is the second time they planted it. The first time they planted it, uh, they had very little um, germination, and uh, a lot of it died that did germinate. And so they planted it again when they had a window uh, of soil uh, moisture, and then the, the whole crop failed as well. So that's what we can look forward to, and how, how do we become less vulnerable then. So um, I put this in here because I'm bragging, and uh, I won an award, or the farm won an award uh, from the Commonwealth for, for innovation and sustainable development under the prosperity category. Um, and I got to meet Prince Harry and, and, and the Secretary General, who's wonderful. And uh, while I was over there, my, my stepson, Wilfredo Magana, who's in the picture, who's, uh, who's a second lieutenant in police defense force, uh, came to the, the award ceremony and, and we got to talk, somebody took his picture. I put it in there mostly because it was a pivotal moment for us because it was the first time we had people who understood exactly what we were talking about when we talked about how, how do we draw down carbon using degraded land and increase food security. Uh, and so uh, it, was, it was a big moment for me. Um, there's a, a, a web page called uh, drawdown.org for Project Drawdown, and they list uh, like 80 or 90, I think it's up to 100 something now, uh, ways to actually uh, mitigate or, or draw down carbon uh, out of the environment. And so this is the land use and ocean use, of course. Um, and out of this, basically everything that they're talking about here um, can be done in Belize, most of it, um, uh, with the exception of things like temperate reforestation and uh, peatland restoration. We don't have, uh, we're not a temperate environment, um, or and we don't have peatland. But all these are ways to draw down carbon. They're actually quantified and show uh, some of them. And so, um, and this is where we are. This is where my wife and I live, and, and uh, we're about two miles up river from San Pedro, Colombia. And I bought a, a degraded citrus and cattle farm back in the late 1980s, and um, quickly found out the cattle were no good uh, by looking at other pastures. I got rid of the cattle within a few months, and about a year into it, I realized that the citrus was at the end of its productive lifespan. And, uh, I started thinking about what to do. And I, I decided to create a multi-strata agroforestry system um, with timber and food and tree legumes and subcanopy species like cacao and, and coffee and turmeric and ginger and vanilla and uh, stuff like that. Um, the first step that you have to do when you're doing this is you have to look at ways to build fertility and also obtain a yield. So pioneer species are actually really useful for this. Um, there's a whole bunch of them, um, things like pigeon pea, uh, gandules or chicharro, the uh, cajanus cajan, which fix nitrogen and help break up soil and inject carbon into the soil. There's other things like uh, peanuts and there that are also legumes. And then there's, uh, in this picture, we have cassava, which breaks up soil, chayo, which provides shade, banana, which changes the, the structure of the soil and also provides biomass. Um, Things like the pigeon pea is actually really useful, and it's not a big food here in Belize, but our neighbors eat a lot of it. And uh, when I was in the Dominican Republic, they ate a lot of it. Also in Costa Rica, they eat a lot of it. And this is a, a potentially important food for the future. It, it's a uh, semi-perennial, fixes nitrogen, and this is actually taken in 2019 in the middle of the drought, where basically the farm looked like the whole farm had been soaked with uh, with some kind of herbicide. We don't use herbicides. Everything was really dry, but the pigeon pea was green. Uh, pineapples planted on contour help to retain soil and the detritus and leaf litter and, and animal manure that accumulates uphill uh, from the pineapple help to create zones of fertility. And of course, with the banana intercrop, we're getting yield out of it as well from the banana. Uh, but this area here is a future coconut-dominated polyculture. Uh, we have got the bright idea that we're going to plant lots of coconuts and retire making coconut oil and get rich doing that. Uh, banana, again, another uh, important um, pioneer species, provides a lot of biomass, provides a lot of food. food. Uh, this is Jamaica red, and some of the bananas we have are on the left, Pijang Rai banana, in the middle is apple banana, to the right is Jamaica red banana, and the one to the back is Blogo banana. Some of them are hand bananas, some of them are cooking bananas, and they're all important for food security. We also feed them to our poultry. Uh, so Forester Farm, this is what we're sort of what we're aiming for, is we're looking for a way to convert our farm uh, into something that mimics 
the arboreal architecture of primary habitat, uh, with the exception that every species in there either has a direct use for us or has a use for the system. So things like there's a Cecilopenia pulcherima, which is pretty, but doesn't really actually provide much for us. It does fix nitrogen. It does provide uh, fodder for pollinators. Um, and there's other things in there. Uh, the keystone of all of this, of course, is food. And so uh, for staple trees, we're really interested in, in tropical staple trees, uh, including things like breadnut, the Articarpus comansi, uh, very high yielding when tree can produce up to 1,200 pounds of food. Uh, breadfruit, very uh, important, uh, common in Belize, but underutilized, and every farmer should have some. Um, um, and then, uh, of course, Ramon nut, Brasamo malacostrum, where we live at the foothills of the Maya Mountain, there's limestone, another potentially important food, and one that's been historically important uh, in, Toledo, in Toledo District and in, in all out throughout Mesoamerica. Uh, peach palm, or Bactris gassy paste, also known as um, uh, Pejibaya uh, is a uh, important staple food. Uh, we worked in the Amazon and the community we were working with there, that was a staple food for them. Uh, one tree can produce up to 160 pounds of food a year. Um, and this is an example of one day. We walked out and in about 45 minutes of uh, my friend Marlon Sutherland and I walking around collecting food. Uh, we collected all of this and off of his right shoulder are two buckets of bread nut um, that uh, we didn't take a picture of, but plenty of food that we collected fairly leisurely. Um, and I'll say that things like the, the coconut, we make coconut oil and the partially defatted meat has value as animal fodder. Cacao is a subcanopy species, an anchor crop that provides yield and Toledo district produces cacao equal to the best cacao anywhere in the world. And I've been to Venezuela and I can say that Toledo cacao is as good as anything they produce. Um, Things like vanilla, another underutilized plant species that is um, common in Toledo district in the bush, but very few people farm it, it's very high value. One kilo is worth about 500 pounds, uh, $500 US right now, excuse me, um, and uh, which is more than the ganja that my neighbors used to grow with not too long ago, because uh, I live in San Pedro, Colombia, it's famous for that. Uh, and then, Things that, uh, subcanopy species that have uh, expanding markets for that have been created. Um, there, there's uh, Naledo, which is uh, exporting turmeric from Toledo district, and turmeric is another excellent subcanopy species. Uh, and all of these species are anchor crops that provide for us. Um, lastly, um, we are faced with an unprecedented series of um, challenges right now. We have a, a rapidly expanding youth population. We have low levels of employment. Our, uh, the, the, basically, the engine of prosperity for Toledo District, and not for Toledo District, for the whole country has been tourism. And tourism has collapsed in the face of COVID. So I think that there's potential to revert back to agriculture. It's important to remember that before uh, the 1980s, uh, or early 1990s when Belize went f fully into tourism, that the, uh, the primary income earners for the country were fisheries, agriculture, and forestry. Um, so I, I think that Belize has potential to uh, work on ways to draw down atmospheric carbon. I think there's going to be the floodgates of international money are going to open very soon uh, to assist farmers to do that. Uh, we, there are proven techniques it can actually do it. We've been working on it for a long time, and actually we still work with the Commonwealth on that. Um, and I think that we have potential in, in Belize to become leaders in this, and understanding this is not far removed uh, from the cultural experience of, of Belize and Belizeans, uh, that, that growing in diversified systems is uh, the way people used to do things before we got dependent on tourism and before monoculture, agriculture became the dominant economic and productive model of agriculture. Uh, my name is Christopher Nesbitt. Thank you very much. Have a good day.